Okay, hello everybody and uh, welcome to this uh, meet and greet. I have the great pleasure and honor to welcome today Phil de Picciotto. Phil, um, I don't know exactly, there's so many things to say about you, I don't know where to start. So would it be fair to say that you are probably the Mr. Sports Management in the world? Um, I think that would be fair. What do you think? Oh, I don't think that would be fair. You know, one of the great things about our relationship going back all of these years is that we see the very best in each other all the time. But I'm, I'm just happy to have a conversation with you about sports management generally. Well, we've known each other for 35 years and um, you're just as modest as you used to be in the beginning. So um, can we come back, go back to, to the origin where you, you started, when you started Advantage International, that's what some 40 years ago, how many people you were and, and what you have made of it today with Octagon, where you are today. I know it's a, it's a, it's, it's a difficult task in such a short time, but if you could just talk us through the evolution from the moment you started Advantage and to what it has become today. Well, sports became globalized really very recently. So I had the opportunity when I was young to see maybe a little bit naively that athletes and entertainers were going to have more and more opportunities and they just weren't being managed very completely. Um, they were being managed well, but in a very linear way. Because as you know, athletes need to spend all of their time developing first and then staying healthy, keeping fit, um, learning their craft and being able to optimize a career that could end at any moment. And even in the best of cases, it's relatively short. All athletes retire or are retired really in their prime. Most other careers would have people just starting at the time that athletes are, are ending. So when athletes are so young and they have to focus so much on their on-court or on-field play, there is a, a good reason to, uh, for them to surround themselves with people who can handle all of the business-related matters and avoid the distractions in order to give them the best chance to succeed. So we saw that opportunity at the end of the first year in 1983, we were 21 people. We were already somewhat global with offices in, in Paris and in London, in Tokyo and in Melbourne, for example. And then over time, we just said yes, I think a few too many times to people. We continued to grow. It wasn't a plan or a goal of ours. So fast forward now for almost four decades, we have about a thousand people who do a lot of different things in a lot of different places for a lot of different kinds of people. And um, that's the summary of the story. Can, can, that's wonderful. Can you just uh, t tell us a little bit of what other things you, because of, of course, Obviously, sports management, managing athletes was, the, was, was what you were doing uh, in the beginning. And then little by little, there was an evolution, it evolved to other things. What other things and just sports or athletes management do you do? There are really four integrated parts holistically of uh, sports management. Um, in no particular order, it's the talent who perform. Without them, of course, there would be no live events and the rest of the business wouldn't exist. There are corporations and, and governments, entities, brands who enable the performances to take place with their financial support, promotional support and general business vision. There's the operation of the events, whether that's through venues or uh, through a, a borrowed or a temporary venue, just uh, for an event, so event management, I would say. And then there's the distribution of that content through media. So it's the combination and the integration of those four components that we are involved with. Okay, and so in, in that management business world, what is your role? What, how do you see your role in, in this whole business, uh, Octagon's role? I think Octagon is in the role of helping other people achieve their dreams um, and, and finding alignment among parties so that all of these elements can come together to create successful and sustainable event platforms. So, uh, you know, talent athletes are only as good as the showcases they have on which to present their talents. It's the old story of a tree falling in the forest if no one is there to hear it, or in this case, if no one is there to see it, then it's a wasted opportunity. So we try to take the best athletes, um, and emerging athletes as well, give them a chance to perform on large stages and then distribute that content through media, 
to create a gl larger global audience and have all of that supported financially for sustainability through either governments or ticket sales or sponsorship partnership revenue. Um, you, you, have, you have represented the athletes in various sports, top athletes, number one in the world. We met at the time uh, in, through tennis. You're representing Steffi Graf, you're representing Manuel, you're representing oh, tons of top 10 players, men's players also, Stefan Edberg, if I remember well at the time. Um, who else? Oh, back in the day, I mean, Jimmy Arias and Michael Chang and, um, and many others. I don't like to name names because I don't want to leave anybody out. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> it, it, then, was, it was a really, it was a different time then. Most tennis players, came from English speaking countries, both yeah. on the men's and the women's side. The top 100, for example, were dominated by players from America, Australia, the UK, and maybe a couple of other territories. And in the early 80s, um, and for the rest of that decade, there was this emergence of primarily European talent and the opportunity to globalize the tours and to make them healthier because the women's tour in particular was subsidized entirely by a tobacco company, Tobacco Money. Um, Virginia Slims was the name of the brand and it became synonymous with women's tennis. So it was important at that time uh, for women's tennis to partner with their parent company, um, Philip Morris, but it became a little bit of an unequal branding opportunity because the tobacco lobby was taking the healthy aspects of young women playing an active sport and using it almost to legitimize smoking while the women tennis players needed a stable financial platform. And Philip Morris was there primarily because they saw that opportunity for them, but they were a, a very limited company, not only in terms of, of the products that they made, but also in their geographic distribution that, you know, as you remember back in the day, mm -hmm. almost all the top players had to come to the United States to play. And that created a tremendous disadvantage for the non-Americans because during off weeks or in an event where someone might lose, you, you couldn't go home. It was too expensive. It took too much time. The time differences were debilitating to an athlete. So we saw that opportunity. No one else seemed particularly interested in developing it. You know, it's always good to find a niche where it's not too crowded. We just got lucky with the timing and we, we, uh, we globalized the tour. Yeah, you of course you obviously you 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 manage tennis uh, players, but you do are all all different sports, uh, American sports mostly, I guess, but also international sports such as golf and so on. And if I'm not mistaken, actually, when you're talking about Philip Morris, I think you you were part of uh, of uh, taking the the advertisement of of uh, cigarette companies out of the sports or out of tennis for sure. Correct? Uh, yes, we were instrumental in removing tennis sponsorship from the governance of tennis. And that was for really a number of reasons. The first was the uh, misalignment of the images, but there was also an economic opportunity that wasn't being exploited by sticking with the past. And the sport hadn't opened itself up to all of these new opportunities at a time when you know health and fitness became much more popular. And there was a, a view of um, empowering women and girls, especially through sport. So the geographic expansion, the financial expansion and the image expansion of tennis were all part of this equation that seemed very obvious to us, but the sport was entrenched otherwise. Yeah, so it's very interesting to see that you start with tennis, you start with managing or, or a big agent of, of tennis players and then it, it moves to other sports and it moves to, to removing a, a uh, kind of sponsorship from um, the uh, from a tour and so on and so and it goes to hundreds of things. So starting from sports for sports management, you can you can move on to marketing. You can do representing not only athletes but also companies, big companies, helping them do their marketing, sell themselves, and things um, like this, which just shows how how large. Um, this uh, this business can be let me just come back to one thing i'd like to talk a little bit now that i have this opportunity to talk to you as i said before we've known each other for 35 years and um i remember uh, a few things i remember one of the first um things that i, I still remember it 
we didn't know each other very well. And um, Manuela, who was Clara's coaching at the time, was uh, her contracts or I think equipment contracts were coming to an end. And you had uh, renegotiated or negotiated a contract and you called me. And I was 24 years old at the time. So um, just I, I didn't have much experience. But I remember that you called me and you said that you had negotiated a contract, a five-year contract. I think it was with Wilson at the time. And, and you gave me the numbers and everything. And I said, okay, uh, well, uh, good, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, and, and basically that was it. And we hung up the phone. And, and three minutes later, you called me back and you said to me, you know, I just wanted to, you to know that we, we don't feel that it's just a good contract. We, th we, we feel it's an extremely good contract. And I remember this because that was my first lesson. The first lesson I received from you is that I realized at that time that it was, so, it was a difficult job for you. Athletes tend to think that they're worth a fortune and you are there as an agent between the company you have to negotiate a contract with to give money and the athlete who might not be happy with what you have negotiated for him. How difficult is that in, in that business? Being in the middle and trying to have to, to, to make everybody happy. Well, you know, we're only as good as our athlete clients. And um, there's an expression in English, which I think probably is a worldwide expression that, that water seeks its own level, which means that typically, you know, clients and agencies find each other um, and are comfortable with the way of communication and the business results both, because athletes have a lot of choices these days. They can be represented by almost anyone and in fact, athletes are represented by almost anyone. I mean, we know one, one very good athlete in the past who was represented by his family dentist. So it, trust is the main factor. And if one has a relationship of trust and one can be open, what one really wants, I think from both sides of the equation is that the athlete feels completely free to stay in his or her element doing what he or she knows best you know, you re referenced our ages. We were we were both very very young, um, but that didn't mean that we didn't have certain expertises. We just weren't expert at everything. We were hopefully at least expert at one thing. So when you have that mutual trust, you borrow the credibility of the other person, and you build a portfolio that enables an athlete to perform well on the court, off the court, health and fitness. Uh, partnerships commercially, financial success, the right schedule, preservation of wealth, media management, image creation, all of these things have to blend together. And the world's much too complicated. It was even back then, but it's much more so now for any one person to do everything. So um, it's, it's a question of having a common worldview, understanding exactly what your client wants, understanding what the market can offer and trying to go to the top of the market at, at any period of time and then managing expectations so that everybody is realistic. You know, it, we, are, we are living in a world where I think human beings are more and more programmed to some sort of relative framework. It's relative to everything else. You, you know, humans compare themselves, whether it's by ranking in tennis or by uh, job status or description or where somebody lives. And managing those relative expectations, expectations relative to others within someone's frame of reference, I think is the key. Thank you. Um, you, you talk about um, uh, trust. I mean, I think we, we worked together for a good 10 years. And um, I, I think that's fair to say we had a close relationship. I mean, there was a lot of trust. You explained to me, I was wondering how to, I didn't know exactly what to do and how to plan the career uh, of, of the players or Manuel at the time. And um, you just told me, listen, don't think about the money. Just make sure she plays the best tennis she can play. If the results come, the money will come and we'll do our part. Basically, that, that's what you just said. And that's one of the lessons, another lesson that I learned from you is concentrate exactly as you said, Concentrate, everybody concentrates on what he or she does best. And when you come together, everybody will have, uh, do its part. And, and that's how uh, you'll get the best results in the end. 
An athlete who is focused on any goal other than optimizing his or her performance either doesn't love what he or she is doing or doesn't have the confidence that it's sustainable or there, there's some other impediment along the way because the goal of any job should never be just earning money, right? It should be improving the world, doing something you love, um, fulfilling some kind of inner um, objectives that you have or uh, whatever it may be. And, and money is a consequence because if, if money were the driver, we wouldn't have any teachers. We wouldn't have any firefighters. We, we wouldn't have people who stayed home to be parents. I mean, some of the most important jobs in the world are not necessarily monetized at levels that, mm -hmm. that make sense or are fair or are dictated by their importance to society. But some people are in professions where because of supply and demand and the way platforms have been built have the opportunity to earn a large amount of money or uh, at least an amount of money that's disproportionate to most of the other jobs that they could have at that age. So those are the privileged few. You know, the athletes who are good enough to be able to play professional sport, to be able to influence the world that way and to be able to get an education by traveling and learning about people from different cultures, et cetera. That's, that's a richness that will translate into personal fulfillment and will also translate into money if it's managed properly. You know, from my point of view, your students have made a very good and important choice in taking your class and being involved in your school because Again, sports is a microcosm of our society. So sports management really requires an amalgamation of learning in all different areas that builds to be uh, the basis for applying good judgment in any circumstance. You know, sports is a win-lose environment. It's very competitive, but when athletes and entertainers step off of their platform, they're re-entering a, a, a world that has to be win-win. And it's important to understand other people, um, what their backgrounds are, what their education is, what pieces of the world puzzle are most important to them. And I think your program fundamentally is providing that to your students and it's extremely valuable. Um, I'd just like to get back on a more, more personal level, just about our relationship. I have a few, uh, I'll tell you an anecdote, just one thing, when I think about our relationship and what went through on the, during um, our, tennis career, those 10 years on the tour, if I had to pick one moment that, um, that was very emotional for me and very, that I will always remember is when, uh, it was in 1990 when Manuela played, she beat Martina Navratilova in the quarterfinal of the US Open. It was night session, stadium court, uh, live TV and so on. And she won that match. Martina hadn't lost before the semifinal of the, of the, the US Open in years. And it was a very emotional, very, very good, good match. And when Manuel won that match, I came off the court. I know you have to walk all these stairs, stadium is so huge. And the first person I come across was you. You had tons of things to do, but you found me. And you came to me and you said to me, you congratulated me. And then you said, it couldn't, I'm so happy for you because it could not have happened to nicer people. I don't know if you remember that, but that's something that I will always remember. 30 years ago, coming from you was a huge compliment. Well, just being successful in a sport does not mean that um, you're guaranteed a certain personality type. Right? Some people carry their competitiveness off the court um, in very healthy ways. Some people may be in less healthy ways. And um, some people just always try to do the right thing and eventually by doing that in repeated fashion, you know, you have the ongoing opportunity to create success and to have new things happen and to be rewarded for all the hard work and the way other people are treated. And so when, when good people win, there are a lot of people out there who just feel exceptionally happy for you. And most of the time, the athlete and the coach and the people around the family don't get to feel that or see that or experience that, you know, they're, rushed off into press conferences and then they're rushed back to the hotel so they can get a rest or a massage or eat the right food because they have to go out the next day and do it all over again. So I think it was 
it was it was the right you know i just there was no hesitation in in my part i i think i spoke for thousands of people who were there that day and who were back home in switzerland and in bulgaria and in other places who were watching around the world japan where where manuela had an enormous following but not only there and all these other places as well just to say to you really from the world um congratulations on this new achievement it was spectacular and you have a lot of people who are rooting for you and especially happy tonight. Is it is there one once one one anecdote or something, one moment that you remember from the 10 years we spent on tour together? If you had to pick oh, one. I, I remember many. And you know, one of the things that I've learned, which has been a career extender for me, is really not to talk about things that are uh, quite personal in the relationship between an agency and, and a player in that environment. But um, I, I will tell you one moment that I remember specifically where I was very happy and also a little bit relieved. You know, uh, if you remember Manuela's final trip to Japan yeah. and she was, uh, she played two tournaments there and um, the second one was in Osaka and she uh, was beloved really in that country and had had a very long year and all the players were were exhausted and she fell behind in in a match that she she ended up pulling out and winning and she won that tournament and then decided that she knew at that moment that that's the way she should finish her career yeah absolutely. So that that to me was a, a fairy tale yeah and it was it exemplified everything that manuela was as a player and as a person and that you had put into helping her to optimize her skills and you know in in this magnificent way there was a crowning achievement that basically enabled Manuela to walk away on her own terms um, with the adoration of the world having accomplished so much in the course of her career and I, I will never forget that it doesn't happen very often it may never happen again it's true it was a fairy fairy tale moment absolutely she was down five two in the third with match point and she won at 7-5 and it was the last match of her career in Japan and everything. It's true. That was a, that was a spe special moment. Um, I'd like to ask you something now about um, when you when you recruit people um, to work for you, what are obviously, I mean, it depends on, on uh, what area the person is going to work uh, in, but what are you looking for really in, in these people? Is it the personality? Is it the, um, the, the, the background? Is it, uh, what, what is it exactly that you're looking for? Well, the two things that we keep in mind when we're hiring are first that sports is a microcosm of society. So everything that is reflected in society, we, we need to reflect in the world of sports management. We need to be able to deal with all kinds of people and we need to apply all kinds of skills. And leading from that, the second point is that sports is only a career for athletes or for coaches, or maybe for trainers. For everybody else, sports management is an application of a professional skill set. So we're looking for people, for example, who are very good lawyers who want to apply their legal skills and knowledge to sports because they understand that content, or people who love journalism and are good writers and want to apply that to sports, or are good medical professionals and want to apply that towards sports. Uh, it could be economists, it could be financial planners, it could be media managers, it could be any you know, marketers or salespeople. So if you devolve it down to four particular skills that I think are absolutely critical for anyone in the industry and beyond the industry, because again, it's, it's a reflection, a mirror on the world, those four in no particular order would be expertise. You know, everybody should be good at something. Ideally, they would be good at something that's a little bit different from what everybody else is good at because that creates exceptional market value. Then commitment, dedication, passion. If you love what you do, you're going to do it more. The more you do it, you're going to become better at it, which will be self-fulfilling prophecy to, to lead to, I think, a fulfilling and a, and a successful career. The third is an overused word. Um, but it has an expansion element to it, and that's integrity. If you want to stay around for a long time, you have to plan to treat people the right way. So you have to be reliable. You have to be consistent. You don't want to surprise people in, in negative ways. 
And then the fourth, because of the complexities of the world and the complexities of these sports management jobs, you have to be collaborative. You have to understand that being part of a team is a fundamental concept in sports, and it has to be a fundamental concept around the provision of services to those who are in sports. Okay, uh, our time's running out, so I still have one question that I'm very interested to, to, to having your answer. And what, what do you, how do you see sports, sports management, sports business evolve in the next five to 10 years? Well, if one's interested in the future, I think one also has to be aware of the history because trend lines are, are long and not a snapshot in time. You know, history doesn't start always at one moment um, having ignored its own past. So where sports management has come from is a very specific contract negotiation, advocacy for a player in his or her employment contract um, silo. That's where it's come from. Over the last 30 or so years, it has evolved from being largely a legal profession to being largely a marketing profession because talent, athletes, more and more are their own brands, they're human brands, and if one doesn't manage them for the long term, one loses value with age. You know, very often brands gain value with time. You know, your best asset as an investor, for example, is, is the time value. But, you know, athletes come there on a big stage and then if they're not prepared, they disappear from that world stage. And the, that infamous 15 minutes of fame is really becoming more like five or 10 minutes of fame. Things are happening in shorter, shorter cycles. People are thinking that way. It, it, the world is ultra competitive and small changes make very big differences. So I believe that the evolution is gonna to continue to be that athletes have a very powerful and influential voice that can continue post-career, provided that their brands are built in a way that continues to resonate with the public. You know how wonderful uh, it is uh, for me to talk to you and how lucky we are to, to be able to talk to you and, 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 and for you to share some of your experience. If any time you come to Switzerland, you know, we're in Lausanne, you have, uh, you have Swiss blood, no, if I'm not mistaken, correct? I do. I do. do. So if you ever come to Switzerland in the next couple of years, please come by and if you if you would come and share some of your experience with our students it'd be absolutely wonderful that's one thing and the second thing is you know you have agencies in i don't know 20 countries 20 plus countries in the world so if our students if you need a or or, or are willing to give a couple of our students an internship for a week a month or a couple Obviously, we'd be very, very, very pleased with that. So just keep it in mind. And the last thing I want to say, the reason why I, one of the reasons why I created Sports Management School is that um, I've, I've learned a lot in, in the, in, through sports as a, as, a, as a coach and learned a lot from you. Not only um, as far as Sports is concerned. Also, we, philosophically, we, we talked about things. One thing I'll always remember, one thing you told me and that I have been using since in sports, in business, in private life, is you told me once that an old man, wise man, had told you that when we're young in life, everything is black or white. And as years go by, we end up realizing that actually everything is different shades of gray. And it can be very light gray, very dark gray, but nothing is ever fully black or fully white. We're not going to talk about this too much because we can, we can talk for it for, for ever, about it forever. But it was very interesting. And I've used that, um, always still using it today. And still, uh, it, it helped me a lot understand things, understand business, understand people, understand life. So anyway, what I'm trying to say is all these, th these things I've learned, I want to, that I've learned from you and other people, I, I want to be able to give back and uh, give back to the students. Um, I wish at that time I could have 
had the you know somebody who who gives me some some lessons and and tells me things like this i learned it my way but anyway it was wonderful to have you and i hope to have you again thanks for everything and good luck for octagon and all the rest and please if you're uh, in switzerland please come by well, thank you for inviting me to talk to you today and for your lovely invitation to meet next time in person, which I will look forward to doing. And I, I guess maybe it doesn't need any reminder, but just looking at each other now, the shades of gray that develop in life are exemplified <laughs> by our hair color. <laughs> You're the best. And I have to say, I have to say this to, to end it. I am still stunned that every year, even though you know probably 500 million people around the world, every year on my birthday, I get an email from you. And that, that is really something special. You're my hero. Anyway, thanks a lot, Phil. Thanks for everything. Good luck and hope to see you soon. Yeah, the very best to you. You're in your element there. So keep doing your, your, uh, your tutelage. You were born to be a professor. <laughs> thanks, Phil. Bye. Bye. See you soon, I hope.